What I want to do is to look at the risk factors that are unique to women. And obviously, the major of them are the complications of pregnancy. Now, the newer oral contraceptives seem to have less of a risk than the earlier ones because the formulations are different. Now we're going to the conventional cardiovascular risk factors. What we will be talking about for the next few minutes is transforming cardiovascular prevention for women. And I've chosen to use the term, as you will see in a moment, time for the Pygmalion construct to end. These are my disclosures. And here is the reason for my choice of that statement. As long ago as 1912, George Bernard Shaw had the play Pygmalion performed in England. We know it best outside of England as My Fair Lady, the stage play and the movie. And what we see there is the protagonist, Sir Henry Higgins, repeating again and again, why can't a woman be more like a man? And I have for you three reasons. And these relate to risk factors. First, non-traditional coronary risk factors are unique to or predominant in women, and we'll look at those. And then even the traditional coronary risk factors, many of them impart a differential risk for women and for men. But most importantly, gender-specific risk assessment and management has the potential to improve outcomes for women. You've seen this slide before, and what you see is that once we begin to pay attention to sex-specific issues, women noted in the red and men in the blue, that since about the year 2000, there was a very sharp decline in cardiovascular mortality for women, but I want to emphasize today for you something else, and that's the end of the curve. And that is that the steep decline that we've seen in the US has seemed to increase in men and to plateau in women. And that tells us that we have something to worry about, about the risk factors. More about that later. I want to outline the magnitude of problem as I see it in my country where cardiovascular disease is a leading cause of morbidity and mortality for women. One of every four women in my country die of cardiovascular disease, and that's a mortality twice that of all forms of cancer combined. But as the basis for that, two of three US women have at least one major coronary risk factor, and that percentage increases with older age. Now, what I want to highlight is the reason for this plateauing, and it's not uniform. We see problems in the younger women, those women aged 35 to 40, 54 years old, where their mortality is now beginning to increase by about 1% per year, totally reversing the trend of the past four decades, where we saw a decrease in Framingham risk scores now they're increasing. And in my country, probably the major issue is the obesity epidemic and the sedentary lifestyle. But because the risk factors underlie this problem, there is the importance of preventive cardiovascular screenings for women. Now, I want to highlight that women are not a uniform group and that there are disparities among women in my country. African-American women are at much higher risk. Almost half of the African-American women have some form of cardiovascular disease. Hypertension is present in about 44% of African-American women. It has an earlier onset and it is more severe, and it has more severe end organ damage. They have more metabolic syndrome, they have higher rates of cardiovascular disease than do their Caucasian sisters, and when we see patients hospitalized for an acute myocardial infarction, 
black women have the greatest risk factor burden. So there is something that should have been preventable early on, and they are less likely to receive evidence-based therapies. There is a totally different paradox with the Hispanic women. Now, this is not a genetic group. This is a group identified by language, and that's one of the weakness of that categorization. But Hispanic women have double the diabetes than do their non-Hispanic sisters. And the paradox is, even though they have more diabetes, they have lower mortality and a greater life expectancy than non-Hispanic white women. And we're now looking to say, what is it about these Hispanic women that gives them protection? And some of it may be psychosocial issues, things that we've not looked at previously. What I want to do is to look at the risk factors that are unique to women. And obviously, the major of them are the complications of pregnancy. And as I've said the other day, a detailed pregnancy history is an integral component of risk assessment for women. And all of the pregnancy complications, preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, pregnancy-induced hypertension, preterm delivery, and small for gestational age infant. All of these are early indicators of subsequent increase in cardiovascular risk for women, and as a matter of fact, an increased risk for their babies. You've heard people say throughout this meeting that pregnancy is probably the first stress test that a woman undergoes. And these cardiovascular and metabolic stresses have the potential to early predict future cardiovascular risk. And I've talked yesterday about the shared risk factors for preeclampsia and cardiovascular disease. Now, when the woman has preeclampsia or gestational diabetes, she has a three to six fold increase in subsequent hypertension, a doubled increase of subsequent ischemic heart disease and stroke. Now, you know, we were all taught that preeclampsia subsides with the delivery of the placenta. That's certainly absolutely not true. There is residual endothelial dysfunction, it is measurable, and importantly, it has been associated with an increased coronary artery calcium, which to me means atherosclerosis. Gestational diabetes obviously increases the risk of subsequent times two diabetes. So what we have to do Remember, a few minutes ago, I talked about the fourth trimester of pregnancy. We have to begin cardiovascular risk reduction after the woman delivers and continue it throughout her lifespan. What about oral contraceptive therapy? There's no apparent cardiovascular risk in healthy women who have no risk factors. But if you give oral contraceptives to a smoking woman, there's a sevenfold increased risk. If the woman is hypertensive, there may be an increase in hypertension. And among the older women receiving oral contraceptives, there's an increased risk of stroke, and that increases serially with age. We all know that oral contraceptives are at risk of VTE in patients with factor V Leiden, and they should never receive oral contraceptives. They have a 30 to 50 percent risk of increased venous thromboembolism. Now, the newer oral contraceptives seem to have less of a risk than the earlier ones because the formulations are different, and they don't seem to impart risk for women without risk factors. But beware of the woman who smokes, of the woman who has antecedent hypertension. And the fact is, if you prescribe oral contraceptives to a woman, you should do a conventional risk assessment screen and intervene when appropriate. Now, something that is new to our generation is the issue of hormonal fertility therapy. And probably the best data that we have comes from a Canadian population cohort. And what Dr. Udell and his associates found is that in women who had successful fertility therapy, a healthy live baby, 
they seem to have a lowered risk of mortality, coronary disease, stroke, TIA, thromboembolism. They seem to do better, all ages and all income groups. But obviously, this is self-selection. I think we're looking here at a healthy cohort bias. And then what they did two or three years later is to go back and look at those women who had unsuccessful fertility therapy, no live baby. And they had an increase in cardiovascular risk. And the question is, is it due to the patient characteristics? Is it due to the fact they had multiple cycles of hormonal therapies? But I think there's a major difference. The woman who has a history of unsuccessful fertility therapy is at increased risk. And I think that's not part of the usual medical history that we get. That's in their OBGYN history. That has to go into our medical records. We've spoken a great deal yesterday about menopausal hormone therapy. And here we saw where the clinical trial data dramatically altered clinical recommendations and clinical practice. And the US Preventive Services Task Force tell us that menopausal hormone therapy is not recommended for the primary prevention of any chronic condition and not recommended for the primary or secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease. And we've looked at those data in great detail yesterday. Systemic autoimmune disorder is certainly not unique to women, but far more prevalent in women than in men. And what we see is when you have systemic autoimmune collagen vascular disease, these women are at increased risk of coronary disease and of stroke. And as a matter of fact, the woman with systemic lupus has coronary disease as her leading cause of morbidity and mortality. In rheumatoid arthritis, there's a two to three-fold increased risk of MI and cardiovascular mortality. And therefore, what you do is in these patients, you screen them for conventional cardiovascular risk factors and intervene when appropriate. And remember, I told you that in our Women's Heart Center at the Emory University School of Medicine, we have the practice of embedding our cardiologists where the patients are. We have our cardiologists in the preeclampsia follow-up clinic. We also have them in the rheumatology clinic so that they are available where the patients are seen and the rheumatologist essentially just sends the patient down the hall to the cardiologist for risk factor screening and risk factor intervention. More recently, psoriatic arthritis has been shown to increase cardiovascular event risk, but not cardiovascular mortality. Now let's go back. We went over those risk factors that are either unique to women or more prevalent in women. Now we're going to the conventional cardiovascular risk factors, and I want to start off with hypertension. We know that hypertension is the leading cardiovascular disease worldwide, but the population-adjusted mortality in women is almost double that for men, 29% compared with 15. We see in most countries that men are more likely to be hypertensive when they're younger, but after age 65, women tend to have more hypertension than men. Importantly, and I think underappreciated, is that there's a very impressive correlation of body mass index with an increase in systolic blood pressure in women. So the obese women are those who are at greater risk of systolic hypertension. In my country, 80% of women who are older than 75 years of age have hypertension. I'd be curious to know what it is in India. But what we see in the non-industrialized countries is there is not this increase in blood pressure with age that is seen in my country. And we don't know why. What is there about the non-industrialized societies that does not have the age-associated increase in hypertension? Elderly women, again, the group more likely to have hypertension, have less control. Even though they are treated, they are less likely to be treated to target than are men. 
And that's one of the problems when we do sex comparisons. We often do treated compared with untreated. What we should be doing is treated to target as compared with treated and not at target and untreated. Those are the three variables. Let's talk about cigarette smoking. About 17% of women in my country smoke, and the adoption, the new adoption of cigarette smoking is more common in younger women than it is in younger men. And good studies from the United Kingdom show us that if you have a woman smoker, she has a 25% greater cardiovascular risk than the man smoker. So this is a very prominent risk factor for women, and it triples their risk for subsequent myocardial infarction. Smoking was associated with an increase in the STEMI rate in women, but not in men. But the greatest increase in risk was among the younger women, those aged 18 to 49 years. So your young woman smoker is at higher risk of STEMI. And when we talk about interventions, smoking cessation is the most cost-effective cardiovascular risk intervention in the United States. Now let's talk about diabetes. We've had some conversations before, and the risk in women is greater than in men, a greater risk of incident coronary disease and stroke. And when we look at patients in hospital with an initial myocardial infarction, the women are far more likely than men to have diabetes. About a fourth of the women with an initial myocardial infarction will be diabetic as compared with about 16% of the men. And the correlation uh, of cardiovascular mortality with diabetes is greater in women than men, likely because when we look at the total cardiovascular risk profile, cardiovascular risk factors tend to cluster in diabetic women, much more so than in diabetic men. Diabetic women have less treatment and less control of their cardiovascular risk factors. Now, when we look at interventions, in a number of studies, we see that when we have pre-diabetic women, lifestyle interventions, diet, physical activity, non-smoking, may be more important for women than for men. And when we prescribe exercise, women with diabetes seem to require a greater frequency and intensity of exercise than men to decrease cardiovascular events. But most important, we say women are less likely to have a coronary event. That gender benefit is totally lost in the context of type 2 diabetes. What about cholesterol management? Cholesterol has the highest population adjusted risk for women. It's 47%. And I'm not even going to try to review the studies for you that says there is similar statin benefit for women and for men. But I want to call your attention to the 2018 ACC AHA cholesterol guidelines because certainly you use the ASCBD risk score to define risk, but there are variables that may help you decide whether or not you will prescribe cholesterol-lowering medications. And there are three issues that are specific to women that I want to highlight for you. You have to consider premature menopause, pregnancy-associated disorders when you talk about lifestyle interventions and potential benefit of statin therapy, because women with these problems are at greater risk. Very important is that sexually active women of childbearing age who are treated with statins should use a reliable form of contraception. And third is women of childbearing age who plan to become pregnant should stop their statin one to two months before pregnancy is attempted. And if they become pregnant while on a statin, obviously the statin should be discontinued immediately. But that's a discussion I find that we often don't have in statin-treated women of childbearing age. What about obesity? Two of three women in my country 
is either obese or overweight. And what are the concomitants of that obesity? Hypertension, hyperlipidemia, physical inactivity, and insulin resistance. And obesity increases coronary risk, you see the numbers, more for women than for men. Now, fascinating is we always think about low-income countries as areas of starvation. That's not the case. Obesity is double in women compared with men in low- and middle-income nations, but it's equivalent in men and women in the high-income nations. And obesity is a significant problem in women in the developing world. Physical inactivity. A third of adults in my country are physically inactive, more women than men. But in the inter-heart study, the protective effects of exercise seem stronger for women than for men. Physical inactivity is the most prevalent risk factor for women in my country, with a fourth of the women saying they have no regular physical activity and three-fourths less than the recommended amount. And this is despite the fact that we have studies specific to women. In the nurse's health study, women who exercised regularly were less likely to develop diabetes. In the same nurse's health study, the diabetic women who were physically active had a lower risk of cardiovascular events. Now, for secondary prevention, obviously, we recommend exercise-based rehabilitation. We've not talked about rehabilitation enough at this meeting. Probably at another meeting, we will. But women are 55% likely to participate. They are less likely to be recommended, less likely to attend, and less likely to complete. Depression is not usually considered among risk factors, but I've chose to consider it because the psychosocial issues, and in particular depression, preferentially disadvantage women. Again, in the inter-heart study, psychosocial factors were more responsible for cardiovascular mortality in women than in men, and there were a variety of them. It was stress at home, stress at work, financial stress, major life events. What we know is that diagnosed depression increases cardiovascular mortality independent of the severity of the depression. Now, we're not sure whether it's the depression per se or the fact that depressed people have high-risk behaviors, that they're not adherent to therapy, but we do know that young women with established coronary disease and depression have an increase in mortality. And this is why the American Heart Association recommends the standard two-question depression screening score in all cardiovascular patients, and if you get a positive result, a more detailed score. Depression is a risk factor for adverse outcomes with acute coronary syndromes. And what we're seeing is with the increase in global violence and current global instability, uh, we're seeing more depression but the problem worldwide is that there are cultural taboos in access to care. So we are calling this, rather than depression or psychiatric care, we're calling it health behavior interventions and health behavior maintenance. And I think just changing the words and the name of the area to which you refer the patients Oh, really will undo some of these cultural uh, taboos. I want to use aspirin just as a sample drug, and we've talked about aspirin for cardiovascular prevention. The previous recommendations uh, were for primary prevention in men, but not women. And the reason was that in the women's health study, aspirin, low-dose aspirin, prevented stroke, but not MI. But there was a substantial risk for GI bleeding, and I don't think that was appreciated. And this was in contrast to physicians, where there was benefit for MI, but not stroke. Now we're even challenging aspirin for men. And in my practice, I use aspirin for primary prevention only in patients who have a multiplicity 
of risk factors, because I think those have not been addressed in the clinical trials. The clinical trials are looking at patients who are well controlled, uh, and trial patients don't often mimic community patients. Obviously, there are comparable gender recommendations for aspirin use for secondary prevention. I want to spend a minute reviewing with you the issues of cardiovascular awareness in women. And I'm sure that my data for the US mimic the data that you have here in uh, India. Only about half of women in the US recognize heart disease as their major cause of death. Most are concerned with breast cancer. And even though we've had 15 years of the Heart Truth campaign and the Go Red for Women, Early on, we saw an increase from about 30% awareness to about 50% awareness, but it's plateaued. And we see the greatest lack of awareness in the highest risk population, and those are the women of racial and ethnic minorities. But it's not the women, it is the healthcare providers as well. And what we've seen is that the healthcare providers that are unaware of the vulnerability of women to heart disease recommend suboptimal application of preventive interventions. They do less appropriate diagnostic testing. They are less adherent to evidence-based guidelines. And obviously, that translates into poor outcomes for women. Now, I will identify for you that the underrepresentation of women in the clinical trials and the studies and the lack of gender specific analysis gives us less of a robust database for women than for men, but it is there. We, in this decade, are talking about personalized medicine, and the first step to personalized medicine is incorporating information about sex and gender differences. Let me summarize with what I consider the key global issues. We have to educate the population, but women in particular, about cardiovascular risk factors, particularly the modifiable behavioral risk factors. <laughs> we have to tell the women that basic lifestyle modifications will lessen hypertension, dyslipidemia, obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular risks. And most prominent among those are smoking cessation, a diet restricted in sodium and saturated fats, an increase in fruits and vegetables, and an increase in habitual exercise. We have to have messages targeted to women, particularly in low and middle income nations. And the organizations that are directed toward women's health have to engage women on a community level. This is the way we will lessen the risk of cardiovascular disease, MI, and sudden death. But important is that we have national programs and policies and plans for cardiovascular prevention and that those plans target women. And I thank you for your attention. Insights from the world's best medical minds. You are watching the right doctors.com.